Today, I'm going to demonstrate configuring the heterogeneous services. These are a facility Oracle provides that lets your applications communicate with third party databases. This is something that many of our clients have to do nowadays, perhaps to external services such as Snowflake Data Warehouse, perhaps to internal systems that might be running in a SQL server. Whenever the remote databases, the HS heterogeneous services will let you run SQLs against it. Select and DML, no problem. DDLs are more work, but should be possible using the DBMS SQL procedures. A requirement is a driver for the remote database. That will be some form of dynamic link library that understands how to log on to the remote system. It will invoke the code you want to run against it and return the results through the gateway to your Oracle session. For full functionality, you can buy the driver from Oracle, and that may cost quite a bit. For example, the Teradata gateway is over $100,000. The SQL Server gateway is only $17,500. You may also be able to buy the drivers from the vendor of the remote system, or there are various third party companies that make their own. And these will have varying prices and varying functionality. Alternatively, you can do it for free using ODBC, the Open Database Connectivity API that most database vendors support for most operations. And that's what I'm going to demonstrate today because while it can be tricky to get it working, it's perfectly adequate for many environments. There are several steps you have to go through to configure an ODBC gateway. And whenever I do this, I find it helpful to remind myself of all the layers that the query will pass through. First, the SQL statement itself will refer to a database link. There should be nothing odd about this compared to a normal database link to a different Oracle database. Though you may need to be careful with data types, character sets, case sensitivity. The database link will include credentials for the remote system and a TNS name's service name to identify it. The TNS name service points to a listener, which could be on a remote system, could be a listener maybe on a different layer in your firewall structures. So it will point to a listener and a SID, a system identifier. Now, the listener will map the SID to an ODBC DSN, a data source name. The DSN will point to a parameter file. And that file, the init file, has the detail of the database driver to run and the address of the remote system. So let's do it. In this demonstration, I'm going to connect an Oracle database on my local Windows PC to a MySQL database that I created on an OCI cloud server. Right, first, I'll just log on to my the MySQL database, just so you can see there's absolutely nothing special about it. Run the MySQL workbench. And if you look at that, let's see, I'm just going to, that's the internet facing address of an OCI cloud server I created. And there's the default schema, MySQL. So if I connect to that, there I am connected to it and just the default schemas there. My local database is here under Windows. And I'm going to work in the Scott demonstration schema. Now, the first step is to install the ODBC driver for MySQL. 
and I'm going to download that from here. I shall take the 64-bit MSI installer down it comes and install it. That's that done. The second step is to create the ODBC data source. That's configuring the DSN, the data source name. To do that, standard Windows utility, ODBC AD32.exe. Now, there are various types of DSN you can use. Uh, I would always use a system DSN, which is going to be visible to everybody. It makes life generally much easier. I suppose in some high security environments, you might use, use a user DSN. But a system DSN is what one would normally use. Add. And which driver do I want to use? The one I just installed, the MySQL ODBC8 Unicode driver. Give the data source a name, JW will do, description, by DSN. The TCP IP server, that's the address of the machine where my remote database is running, which is, that's the internet facing address. The port 3306 is the default for MySQL. I put a user in there called JW who has a password. And the database, I'll go through the default MySQL. See if it works. Looks good. And OK on that. Now, what that will have done is create an entry in this file. Type slash windows slash odbc.ini. Under Unix, it's in the etc directory. And we see just the bare bones here. There's my data source JW. And there's the driver that's going to be used, which is the one that was downloaded earlier. We don't see anything else because I chose to create a system DSN. With a system DSN, the rest of the details are stored in the registry. So if we launch the registry editor and in HK local machine, software, ODBC, ODBC.ini, and there's the detail of what I created. There's the IP address and logons that we used. The third step, configure the gateway parameter file. Now, that is a file. I should just create it with notepad. And you've got no choice of where you put it. It needs to be in your Oracle home of the machine you're using where the listener will be running. And then the directory HS, Heterogeneous Services, admin, and then the naming convention. This must be called init JW MySQL, that's the name I'm going to use, dot aura. JW MySQL is the SID I'm going to use, that the and the, list, the listener will use that SID to identify which of these init files, if you have several, are going to be needed. 
Now, this file can become quite complicated, but the minimum you can get away with is just these two entries. HS FTS Connect Info equals JW. That is the DSN. So that's telling, going to tell the listener where, you know, where the DSN is. And the DSN, remember, has the detail of the driver to use. And then the location of the odbc.ini file. You may need to add more parameters to this uh, in more complex environments, but that minimum will often do. File, save. Now on to the fourth step, which is configuring the listener. Edit my listener at all entry, and I need to add a static registration, a static entry using SID list for my listener, SID list, SID desk, and the SID name JWMySQL. And that SID name is used to identify the appropriate init file when we actually use the gateway. So it points to, so we've got the address of the listener. The SID is used to identify the file. And then we have an instruction that when someone requests a logon to that SID, what we'll actually do is launch that program. That program. That's the database gateway for ODBC. And we'll be running it from that Oracle Home directory. If I look at the listener itself, LSNRCTL status, at the moment we see just the local database, but if I give it a reload, now we see the static registration there of the gateway service. The fifth step, we need a TNS names alias. And in my TNS names file, I shall include this entry here, jwmysql equals. And there we have the address of the listener and its port, of course. And in the connect data, I've named the statically registered SID to which I want to connect. And I've said, that we're using, this is a heterogeneous services request. And finally, we create the DB link. So create database link give it a name, and then the authentication details, the credentials to use at the remote site. Uh, note you'll often find you're using double quotes in this infrastructure environment when going to case sensitive environments. You need to be a bit careful with that. And that of course is the pointer to the alias in the TRS names file that we created a moment ago. And now the moment of truth. Does it work? Select star from DB at JWMySQL, and back come those two rows. And those are the two rows that we saw here when I was logged on directly through the MySQL workbench. So those are the six steps. To conclude, I hope I've demonstrated how simple it can be to configure outbound connections to third-party databases. However, it's only fair to say that it isn't always that easy, and we've had to deal with various, occasion, various issues on occasion. If you really can't get what you need to work using the free-of-charge ODBC technique, well, then you'll have to spend some money. But we have found that ODBC is good enough for most sites. 
If you liked this video, please like it and subscribe to our channel.